Hey guys, welcome to today's class. Have fun. Today I'm talking about the particulate nature of matter. Okay, so matter can be simply defined as anything that has weights and occupies space from basic physics definition. We're talking about looking at matter from the chemistry point of view now. Matter can be simply divided into three discrete particles, which are atoms, molecules, and ions. So we're looking at what these three parts of matter simply talks about. We're talking about atoms. An atom is the smallest indivisible particle of an element which can take part in a chemical reaction. So when we're talking about atoms here now, You'll be able to establish that this is a matter now. Now, this large area can be broken into tiny particles, which tiny particles. Now, these smaller particles of the matter, which can, okay, these are the atoms. So what this definition is trying to tell us that the smallest particle of any matter, the smallest particle in the sense that it is not divisible any further, the smallest particle of any element substance is the atom. Because this small particle now carries the chemical elements of that substance. So an atom is the smallest indivisible particle of an element which can take part in a chemical reaction. Also, we have molecules. We're talking about molecules. A, mo a molecule is the smallest particle of a substance that can normally exist alone and still retain the chemical properties of that substance, be it an element or a compound. Okay, now. So, when we have a group, a group of atoms now, so we can refer to this as a molecule, a group of atoms mix up molecules so basically atoms cannot simply exist alone in most cases a group of atoms come together to form molecules so the molecule is also the smallest particle that can normally exist and also it can retain the chemical properties of that substance so you can see there is similarity between atoms and molecules but atom is the smallest indivisible particle of that element. So talking about molecules, we're going to be seeing stuff like atomicity, ion, the combining power of elements as we move further. So the third part of matter is simply known as ion. So we are talking about ions now. An ion is any atom or group of atoms which possesses an electric charge. So when we're talking about atoms, let's say for example you have hydrogen. An example, H ties the symbol. So this is one atom of hydrogen. So when we have H2 now, I refer to this is a molecule. Because a molecule consists of atoms. So this is a molecule. I'm talking about ions now. I said ions are any atom or group of atoms which possesses an electric charge. So we are talking about ions now. Ions are atoms or molecules which are incomplete due to the charges they carry. So we're talking about H plus now. This is an ion. Now the plus here means that this hydrogen atom has lost one of its electron which we are going to be seeing in the structure of the atom in subsequent classes. So ions can either be positive charge or negative charge. So when the ions are posit positively charged, we call them cations. While when they are negatively charged, we call them anions. So simply, quickly looking at atomicity now. So I said earlier when we talk about molecules, molecules consist of a number of atoms. So the number of atoms in a particular element or the number of atoms in each molecule of an element is called the atomicity. Now a very quick example now, talking about atomicity. 
So a good example now is hydrogen. Hydrogen gas. Now hydrogen gas has an atomicity of two. That's two atoms in the molecule. You have oxygen. Oxygen also has an atomicity of two. You have neon. Neon has an atomicity of one. You have phosphorus. It has four atoms in its molecule. So it has atomicity of four. So atomicity is basically the number of atoms present in the elements. Okay. So now we'll be looking at symbols of elements, symbols of chemical elements. As you all know, we have a large number of elements in chemistry. From the periodic table, you can see the list of elements there. So how did we derive these elements? How did we come about to them? So basically, it was a science, a chemist, a scientist, Berzelius, in 1814. He assigned certain symbols to chemical elements and he used three basic criteria. One is from the first letters. Number two is from the first letter and another letter. Why number three is from the Latin names. So I'll be giving us quick examples now. So the first example here says from the first letters. So example of elements now you have elements that are derived from their first letters. You have hydrogen. Now the symbol for hydrogen is H. So we have beryllium. We have beryllium. The symbol for beryllium is okay. Beryllium. I'm talking about first letters now. I'm talking about boron. Boron is B from the first letter, which is B. We have carbon. Symbol for carbon is C from the first letter. We have nitrogen. Symbol for nitrogen is N. So you can see one of the first system of naming elements is from their first letters H, B, C, and N. So another method of naming elements is from the first letter and another letter. An example now is beryllium. So the symbol for beryllium is B, which is the first letter, and another letter, which is E. So because every element, we cannot keep assigning the first letters to every element. We have to come about another way of naming these elements. So another good example here is magnesium. So the first letter, which is M, and another letter there, which is G. So we we seen different examples as we move on. Another example is aluminium. The first letter and another letter L. So the third method is from the Latin names. So these are the names which we have gotten from the origin, the Latin names now. An example is sodium. The symbol for sodium is N E. N is gotten from the Latin name, which is natrium. Another good example is gold. The symbol for gold is AU, which is gotten from the Latin name. The Latin name is aurum. So these are ways in which you assign symbols to elements. So also we'll be looking at formulas of elements, compounds, and radicals. So Basically, we need to know the formulas, the elements, radicals of the first 20 elements. We all know the first 20 elements, which is hydrogen, which is H. You have helium, you have lithium, you have beryllium, you have boron, carbon, you have nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, you have neon, you have sodium. You have magnesium, you have aluminium, you have silicon, you have phosphorus, 
you have sulfur, you have chlorine, you have argon, you have potassium, you have calcium. So these are basically the first 20 elements. So these are the symbols for the first 20 elements. This is from the first letter, first and second, first and second, first and second, first, 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 the first and second, the first and second. This is from the Latin name, first and second, first, second, first and second, first letter, first letter, so and so on and so forth. This is also from the Latin name. So we'll be looking at there are various ways in which these elements combine to form various compounds. So we should note that compounds are formed from elements. So the combination of the various elements gives us the compounds. So also we have radicals. Now we're talking about radicals now. So radicals are a group of atoms which can be treated as a single unit in molecular formula combinations. So what does this mean? We have simple formulas which are well known, simple formulas which can as well take part in chemical reaction. We have NO3, which we all know as 3 oxonitrate 5. We have CO3 also, which is 3 oxocarbonate 4. We have NH4, which is ammonium, etc. So these are basic radicals which also can take part in chemical reaction as if their respective atoms or molecules. So quickly I'll be looking at relative atomic mass and relative molecular mass. So we're talking about the relative atomic mass. The relative atomic mass, short form RAM. This is the number of times the average mass of one atom of that element is heavier than one twelfth the mass of one atom of carbon 12. It is the ratio of the weight of carbon. So when you are talking about atomic mass, each element given here, they have their respective masses. So because it was not, there is a system of naming, of, of assigning these masses, so which is atomic mass units. So the basic element which was used to de derive the atomic masses of various elements is carbon 12. So the mass of carbon 12 was determined. This is the mass of carbon which is 12. So every other element, their masses are in ratios of carbon 12. So take for example, we want to find the relative atomic mass of hydrogen. So the relative atomic mass of hydrogen now will be the mass of this hydrogen, the number of times hydrogen is heavier than one twelfth of carbon twelve. So to find the mass of hydrogen now, so the average mass of hydrogen over one twelfth of carbon will give us that of hydrogen. And we know that the mass of hydrogen is one. So various elements have their own respective atomic masses. So the relative atomic mass is number of times the average mass of the atom is heavier than one twelve. So when we're talking about relative atomic mass, we're talking about the relative relativeness of the mass to carbon twelve. The number of times that element is heavier than carbon twelve. So if you say the relative atomic mass now of oxygen. 16. What this means is that oxygen is 16 times heavier than carbon 12. So also we have relative molecular mass. We don't talk about relative molecular mass too. It's also similar because when you talk about atoms, atoms mix up molecules. So the relative molecular mass also is the number of times the average mass of one molecule is heavier than 1 over 12, the mass of carbon 12. So similarly, we have to find the relative molecular mass of molecules. Let's say this is calcium 3 oxo carbonate 5. To find the RMM, the relative molecular mass, this is by sim simply combining the relative atomic masses of calcium plus the relative atomic mass of carbon plus the relative atomic mass of oxygen. So these three, the 
will give us the relative molecular mass of the molecule. So also we're talking about a mole. We're talking about masses, masses and masses. So in chemical combinations, we have example we have A and B now. This is this are reactants and this is the product. So in chemical reactions, reactions take place with respect to the number of moles. You want to combine these two elements together. You need to know the amount you are going to require. So this brings about moles. So when you talk about a mole, a mole is the amount containing as many elements, as many elementary entities possible in exactly 12 grams of carbon 12. Remember I said the basics, the basic reference now is always carbon 12. So one mole of carbon 12 contains 6.02 times 10 to the power 23 atoms, which is the Avogadro's number. So when you talk about mole, one mole of any element contains these atoms. Because from Avogadro's principles, we state that equal number of particles of from his experiments, he gave us this value that equal number of um, for, for gases at equal temperatures and pressures, they have the same number of molecules, they have the same number of atoms. So one mole of any element contains this particular number of atoms. So example now, you see one mole of oxygen now. So one mole of oxygen, let's say oxygen, this is oxygen atom, contains this so now we have one mole of oxygen gas. That will be two times six zero two atoms. So just like saying you have one crate of so 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 a crate means two of so in this case now one mole of any atom means six point zero two times ten is power twenty three atoms. So I'm looking at empirical formula and molecular formula so having established symbols elements how elements are formed we need to understand empirical formulas and molecular formulas because these are the ways in which atoms combine with one another to form various elements so empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of the component elements in the compound while the molecular formula gives the exact number of moles of the atoms in one mole of the compound. So quickly, let me talk about empirical formula. Let me talk about molecular formula. The basic difference between these two that this empirical formula just gives a simple formula. Empirical is a simple formula. This one is the exact, which means that molecular formulas are more, are more complex than empirical formulas. A good example now is H2O. Now H2O here is the empirical formula. It is the simplest formula that we know. So when you talk about the molecular formula now, the molecular formula has a factor n so this n which will be calculated which can be calculated gives us the exact formula for water so also we can have ch which is a simple formula for hydrocarbons we can have ch n this n gives us the exact formula so eventually we have n equals to six this will give us C6H6, which is benzene. So, at the end of the class, I'll be looking at examples on empirical formulas and also examples of the various parameters we've been discussing. So, I would come back to the examples. So, also, we'll be looking at looking at molar masses. Molar mass. The molar mass of one, so the molar mass is the mass of one mole of the substance expressed in gram per mole. So you'll be able to establish what is relative atomic mass, relative molecular mass. 
so the molar mass is just a simplification the mass of that molecule in grams per mole is the molar mass so also we're looking at valences and chemical formulas we're looking at how various elements combine to form compounds and molecules so we have okay how to write formulas radicals and valences okay so let me talk about valency now valency is simply the combining power of an element we're talking about valency it's simply saying the combining power of an element or a radical so an element example let's say carbon then this is a radical co2 so the combining power of an element or so the combining power of a radical is what we refer to as valency so i'll be giving us examples so various elements have their various combining powers so these combining powers can also be referred to as the oxidation number So when we look at the structure of the atom in subsequent class, we will be able to establish how these valences oxidation numbers were established. So these oxidation numbers of valency are the amount of atoms or electrons the elements need to complete its octet states. So quickly before we look at the structure of atom in that class, we have this. So these are octet states. You have different orbitals level. This is two. The maximum this takes is two. The maximum this takes is eight. So, paraventure, you have an element which has just one atom. Now, to complete an octet state, this element needs one more atom. So, this one more atom is known as the valency. So, we'll be looking at simple elements now and they are valency so when you talk about hydrogen now, hydrogen has a valency of one so it needs one more atom to complete its shell helium also has a valency of one so in this case now helium is complete but its combining power is one so you can see there's a similarity between the number of atoms it needs the oxidation number and the valency so in some valency is just the combining power which the atom means to carry out um, chemical combinations aluminium you can have aluminium the combining power is three you have copper copper can have a combining power of one or two you have nitrogen nitrogen has a combining power of three or five so you have different elements sodium sodium has a combining power of one zinc combining power of two so also we have for radicals radicals like ammonium it has a combining power of one we have hydroxide that is a combining power of one so basically for radicals the the power of the radicals is simply the valency example you have plus one the valency is one you have minus one is one so in this case now you have so4 to minus this takes tetra of the sulfate six a on the combining power is two so at the end of this class i'll be giving examples of how to calculate for this combining powers but quickly i'll do a simple example so an example now we have we have sodium and chlorine which gives us table sorts that we all know now the combining power of sodium is one the combining power of chlorine is also one so for sodium and chlorine to come together they have to exchange their combining powers so this one has a combining power of one which is plus one this has a combining power of one in this case this is minus one so on coming together they give us sodium chloride 
so also we can have another example you can have you can have aluminium and let's say oxygen oxygen now, now the combining power of aluminium is three the combining power of oxygen is two the valency of oxygen is two so to form an element so basically when you are forming compounds the first thing to do is to write the symbols of the elements oxygen in this case now it is talking about oxygen gas first thing is to write their symbols you write their valences above them so in this place the valency of aluminium is three three plus the valency of oxygen here is minus two so the next thing is to swap their valences so in this case this needs three electrons and this wants to give out two electrons so oxygen simply gives two here and this gives three here so you have so this is a uh, simple reason which combining powers work so you can we have various examples you have PO4 you have calcium oxide so all these are various compounds which are formed from distributing uh, sorry exchanging their combining powers with one another so also in forming equations in forming various equations we need various laws for the combination so we have four laws of chemical combination law of conservation of mass law of definite proportion law of multiple proportion law of reciprocal proportion talking about law of conservation of mass this simply states that matter can either be created or destroyed during chemical reactions but changes from one form to another so when you're having chemical reactions you have a plus b to give you c so this law simply tells us that matter cannot be created or destroyed but can be converted from one form or the other so a and b has changed their form to another form here which is c so another example is another law sorry is the law of definite proportion this law simply states that all pure samples of a particular compound contain similar elements combined by the same proportion so what this law simply tells us is that when you bring different samples samples a b c of a particular compound they simply contain the elements in the same proportion by mass so when you bring a sample of um say copper oxygen so it's say copper two oxide now copper two oxide copper two oxide so what the law of definite proportion is telling us that in every samples of elements of any compounds you bring together they are always in simple ratios now in this case now the ratio here is four to one four to one four to one so every compound every compound has a simple ratio a definite proportion in which the elements are combined by mass you also have law of multiple proportion this law simply states that if two elements a and b combine to form more than one compound the various masses of the elements A and B, which combine separately with a fixed mass of the other elements B, are in simple multiple ratio. So simply, this one tells us that law of multiple proportion. You have an element A, B, to give you C now. So if A combines with B, to give us C and A again can combine with D to give us E. So the law of multiple proportion simply tells that A can combine with B to give us a, a compound, A can combine with D to give us another compound. So this law states that in the combination, A combines with a certain proportion of B to give C, A combines with a certain proportion of D to give E to give in so this a combines separately with fixed masses of another element to give 
multiple compounds this is b so a can combine with 50 percent of b to give c in the same way a can combine with 30 percent of b to give another compound so the last one says the law of reciprocal proportion the law of reciprocal proportion simply state that the masses of several elements a b and c which combine separately with a fixed mass of another element d are the same or are in multiples of the masses so this is something related to the law of multiple proportion also so these laws help us to guide chemical combinations so lastly we're talking about chemical equations chemical equation is simply telling us combination of reactants to form products so a and b here are known as the reactants and c is the product so in forming chemical equations we have to always balance them to give the equal number of the moles so various information provided by chemical equations a chemical equation tells us the reactants and the products it tells us the individual elements or the radicals that form that particular compound it gives us a idea of how elements combine during reactions it gives us the stoichiometry the number of moles combined it tells us the direction of the reaction in this case now this is a reversible reaction it tells us the state of matter in which objects exist so we, i'll be you'll be seeing this in examples so information not provided a chemical reaction does not tell us the speed of the reaction it does not tell us the heat changes it does not tell us the color so these are further further teachings and you see such in rates of chemical reactions equilibrium reactions so quickly we'll be looking at examples of the various topics we've talked about so examples so i would like us to make reference to the topics i've raised so one of the topic i raised here was mole relative molecular mass so number one example let's say we ask to find the relative molecular mass of a compound now now this is lead 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 to trioxonitrate 5 we are asked to find the relative molecular mass now i said the relative molecular mass is the average mass of that compound is the ratio to in respect to carbon 12 the number of times this compound is heavier than carbon 12 so as i always said the relative molecular mass depends on the relative atomic masses of the various elements so in this case now to find the relative molecular mass of this we have to use the relative atomic masses of each element so we have lead we have nitrogen and we have oxygen so the relative atomic mass of lead is 108 the relative atomic mass of nitrogen is 14 the relative atomic mass of oxygen is 16 so for the first 20 elements basically we need to know their symbols their masses and the valences so i advise us to you know to memorize them because we're using them in calculations so to find the relative molecular mass now so in this case now you can see that you have just one mole of lead so one times 108 plus here now we have two moles of nitrogen so two times the relative atomic mass of nitrogen is 14 here now we have three moles three molecules now three molecules of oxygen in bracket two moles now so in this case we have three times two we have six we have six moles of oxygen molecules so that's six times the relative atomic mass of oxygen is 16 so this gives us two reactants two so the relative molecular mass of lead two trioxonitrate five is 232 so in that example here so i was I also talked about moles when we talk about moles say one mole is equal to 6.02 
that is 10 to the power 23 molecules. So let's say we ask to find the number of moles in 20 grams of calcium trioxocarbonate 4, 5, sorry. So we ask to find the number of moles in 20 grams of this. Now remember that this is made up of three elements, calcium, carbon and oxygen. The relative atomic mass of calcium is 40. Relative atomic mass of carbon is 12. Relative atomic mass, mass of oxygen is 16. So we need to find the relative molecular mass. So in this case, we have one mole of calcium, one mole of calcium plus one mole of carbon plus we have three. So you have three molecules here of oxygen atoms. So that's three times 16. So the relative molecular mass of this gives us 100. So that's 100 grams. So we are told to find the number of moles in 20 grams of this compound. So if you can simple, simply analyze now, you know that one mole of the compound is what 100 grams so how many moles now would be 20 would 20 grams be so by simple simply cross multiplying now so 20 grams of this will give us 20 over 100 times one mole simple cross multiplication 20 times one mole divided by 100 so when you do this you have 0 0.2 mole so 0 0.2 mole of calcium trioxocarbonate 5 is how many grams is 20 grams so another example talking about percentage by mass percentage by volume so when we know the molar mass and the relative atomic mass so all the examples i'm doing, I'm doing now is on relative atomic mass and relative molecular mass so Let's we ask to find the percentage by composition of oxygen in SO2 in sulfur four oxide gas. We ask to find the percentage of oxygen in this. So the first thing again, you have S and you have the two elements that makes this up. You have sulfur and oxygen. Relative atomic mass of sulfur is 32 grams. Relative atomic mass of oxygen. 16 gram so one mole of this gas now is how many grams what is the relative molecular mass so to find the relative molecular mass so we have one mole of sulfur plus two molecules of oxygen atoms i'm doing this we have 64 gram so this is the relative molecular mass of the gas so we have to find the percentage by mass of oxygen so that's why what is the mass of oxygen in this gas the relativeness of oxygen in the gas that how, how much oxygen is present in the gas so it's very simple now so to know the percentage of oxygen since we know that one mole of the gas 64 gram so and you know that yeah for the you have s sorry so2 is made up of sulfur and oxygen the relative atomic mass of sulfur like i said is 32 that of oxygen was 2 times 16 which is 32 so this gave us 64 gram you want to do the mass composition of oxygen in this so this is a simple ratio so for oxygen we have 32 over the total mass which is 32 plus 32 100 percent so this gives us 32 over 64 times 100 percent so this gives us 50 percent so first we have to find the relative molecular mass we knew the ram the relative atomic masses yeah it was 32 for oxygen was 16 16 times 2 gave us 32 so 32 over the relative molecular mass so this is simply the ram 
over the RMM times 100%. So this is a very good formula to note. So another example, I have to find you empirical formula. So okay, I also talked about empirical and molecular formula. So let's say we have to find the empirical formula and molecular formula of a compound. So we are giving the relative molecular mass of the compound CH2O as 60 gram. Now this is the basic formula. So we have to find its molecular formula now. So this is the empirical formula. So to find the molecular formula, it's very simple. We simply have to add its masses. So you know if you add the masses, you add their relative atomic masses and relate them to this relative molecular mass. So the mass, we have three elements. We have to write them out. Carbon, the mass of carbon is 12. Mass of hydrogen is 1. Mass of oxygen is 16. So this gives us 4. You have one mole of carbon. You have two at two atoms and you have two you have two atoms to give you the molecule that's two times one and for oxygen you have just one mole of oxygen which is 16. so this gives us 30. so you can see now 30 is the molecular mass of this but we're told to find the relative molecular mass of this compound if this is its mass so to find the relationship between this mass and this we simply have to give this 30 n equals 60 gram like i said earlier when you are given the basic formula let's say ch to find its molecular formula you have to give it a factor n this n tells us the number of moles of that particular compound which gives us the molecular formula because the molecular formula tells us the number of moles in the compound. So in this case now, you have 30 n equals to 60 n equals to 2. So the number of moles for us to have 60 grams of this compound is 2. So in this case now, CH2O2 this will give us 60 grams. So this is C2H4O2. So this now is the molecular formula. So another example we can have, we have to find the empirical formula of comp of certain atoms now. So talking about molecular molecular and empirical formula, like I said earlier, you can use it to find the simple equations of the elements in that compound, the exact equation. So, recall that for you to have a compound, you have to have various elements that mix it up. So, in this case, now you have to find the empirical formula and molecular formula of these elements now. So, what this tells us, how these elements combine to form a compound? So, the question simply states, we are given, state that 26.17% of nitrogen 7.48% of hydrogen and 66.35% of chlorine are mixed together to form a compound. So we have to find the formula for that compound, the empirical and the molecular formula. So these are the mass or the percentage by composition of the various elements. Now to find the empirical formula, the first thing for us to note is their RAM. So the relative atomic masses now of the element for nitrogen, the relative atomic mass is 14, relative atomic mass of hydrogen is 1, relative atomic mass of chlorine is 35 or 35.5. So we are told these are the compositions, the ratio in which they are in the elements, in the compound rather, and we know their atomic mass. So to find the formula, the first thing is to do is to divide the app composition by the relative atomic mass so 
So these are their compositions divided by their relative atomic masses. So if we divide this and this, we're going to have 1.869. This will give us 7.48. This will give us 1.896. So the next thing is to divide by the smallest value. Now the smallest value here is 1.869. So this gives us one, this gives us four, this gives us one. So we, now we can see the number of moles of nitrogen, hydrogen, and chlorine, which forms the compound. So N plus H plus chlorine, the compound which it forms is NH4Cl. So it forms ammonium chloride. So this is the empirical formula. So if you have to find the molecular formula, of this now the molecular formula is n so we have to find the number of moles the number of moles of this compound which will give us the exact equation the exact formula which is the molecular formula but in this case now we are not giving any mass for us to relate to it so this is just the empirical formula so another example now i ask to find the empirical formula of calcium and oxygen which combines so you have calcium and you have oxygen combines to form a compound also so we're told the proportions of calcium and oxygen you have 71.43 percent calcium 28.57 percent oxygen so these are the percentage by mass so recall again the mass Relative atomic mass of calcium is 40. Relative atomic mass of oxygen is 16. To find the empirical formula, you have to divide the percentage by mass by their relative atomic masses. So 71.43 divided by 40, 28.57 divided by 16. This gives us 1.78575. This gives us 1.785625. So you divide by the smallest value. The smallest value here is this. give us one this gives us one so you can see the mole ratio for these two now is one one so calcium and oxygen combines to give us a an empirical formula so to find the molecular formula we need n so that's an advanced form of calculation so the last thing here yeah, looking at chemical equations how to write simple chemical equation so a simple chemical equation now is carbon is a solid you have water which is a gas these two combine to give us carbon oxide carbon monoxide which is a gas and hydrogen so this is a simple chemical re equation so you have symbols these are the symbols of the elements they combine in moles to give us the product you have one mole of carbon one mole of water give us one mole of carbon monoxide and one mole of hydrogen gas you can see that this equation is balanced now you have one mole of carbon one mole of carbon one mole of oxygen one mole of oxygen one mole of hydrogen gas one mole of hydrogen gas so this is a balanced equation so you can also have another equation you have ammonia ammonia gas plus oxygen gas to give us nitrogen oxide gas gas and water h2 gas now so we are looking at this equation now you have N here, one mole of nitrogen, one mole of nitrogen. You have one mole of H3, here you have H2. Here you have one mole of oxygen gas, here you have one mole of oxygen, one atom of oxygen, one atom of oxygen. So, so this equation is not balanced because the number of hydrogen here is 3, the number here is 2. So when, talk, when we are balancing equations, or we, we just want to assign numbers to balance the equation. So the first thing to do here is since the number of hydrogen 
it's not balanced here now you have to assign numbers here so if i put six here six times two i have 12 hydrogen atoms i need to have 12 here so if i put four here four times three i have 12 so hydrogen atom is 12 equals 12 is balanced i need to balance nitrogen and i need to balance oxygen so in this case now i have six atoms of oxygen plus is seven here i have just two so to balance my oxygen now, if I put 4 here, I have 4 plus 6, I have 10 atoms of oxygen. And I put 5 here, I have 10 atoms of oxygen also. So my oxygen is 10 equals to 10, which is balanced. For nitrogen, I have 4 atoms, 4 moles of nitrogen here. I have 4 moles of nitrogen, 4 equals to 4, which is balanced. Thanks for listening. I hope the class was interesting. If you have questions, please drop them in the comment section or send us an email. We would love to help you further. See you in the next class.